much for inviting me. Um, and this talk, the title of this talk, I think I might have said epistemology of faith, but I'm calling it now evidence of faith. Um, but the title, um, I think the exact title probably doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to begin with a story from St. John's Gospel, which you probably would have heard, the story of Doubting Thomas. Thomas called the twin, who was one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he answered, Unless I can see the holes that the nails made in his hands, and can put my finger into the holes they made, and unless I can put my hand into his side, I refuse to believe. Eight days later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The doors were closed, but Jesus came in and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he spoke to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look, here are my hands. Give me your hand. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving anymore, but believe. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You believe because you can see me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Well now, um, we may take Thomas perhaps, as the patron saint of what philosophers now refer to as evidentialists, or proponents of evidentialism. What is an evidentialist? Well, broadly, an evidentialist holds that we ought to believe something to be true only to the extent that our evidence justifies us in doing so, and that therefore believing by a leap of faith is mistaken and wrong. So broadly, evidentialism is opposed to fideism, uh, which comes from the Latin word for faith, of course, um, where fideism is the view that faith properly involves belief commitments that are not justified on the basis of evidence. So the evidentialist says we can only believe in accordance with the evidence, and the fideist says that on some occasions it's permissible to believe without the support. Now, evidentialism was strongly supported by philosophers of the Enlightenment, um, the European Enlightenment, but I, I have two British examples here. Um, David Hume, in his essay of miracles, famously says, a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. But earlier, John Locke, in his essay concerning human understanding, had made essentially the same claim. Um, Locke says, for he, gov he governs his ascent right, and places it as he should, who in any case or matter whatsoever, believes or disbelieves according as reason directs it. I hope you can hear the capital R. He that does otherwise transgresses against his own light, capital L, and misuses those faculties which were given him to no other end but to search and follow the clearer evidence and greater probability. Now, notice that Locke speaks of our reason, capital R, as something that has been given to us. So Locke was a theist, that's a believer in God. So he's actually saying that if we believe other than on the basis of adequate evidence, we're abusing the gift that God has given us. So obviously, Locke thought that believing in God can be justified on the evidence, and indeed, he wrote an essay on the reasonableness of Christianity in support of this claim. <coughs> now, um, Locke's view illustrates an important point, and that is that the debate between the evidentialist and the fideist um, occurs not only between believers in God and non-believers, it occurs also amongst believers themselves. You know, you might have thought, well, it's the evidentialists, of course, they're going to be the atheists and the agnostics and so on, 
and the believers will be fides, but not a bit of it. Um, there are actually, in other words, two evidentialist traditions. First, there is the atheist or agnostic evidentialist tradition, which holds that if only people can be brought to respect evidentialism, a principle that you don't believe beyond your evidence, um, then it will become clear that belief in God is unreasonable because that belief, when we consider the matter fairly and objectively, um, turns out not to be justified on the evidence, or so people at this tradition will maintain. But there is also the theist evidentialist tradition, which agrees that people should believe only on the basis of adequate evidence, but thinks that many people are justified on the basis of evidence in accepting that God exists. And this theist evidentialist tradition opposes the view held by some other theists that belief in God cannot be justified on the evidence but rather requires commitment that involves an existential risk, the risk of faith. Um, and on that fideist view, faith involves, faith, I mean, everybody agrees that faith involves trusting in God, but the fideists think that even more basically, it involves trusting that God exists, even though one lacks adequate evidence for the truth of this claim. For the Fides, faith would not have the value that it does if what is believed by faith could be shown to be reasonable by an intellectual calculation of evidence. Well now, how should we formulate um, the evidentialist claim? Uh, let's return to Doubting Thomas again. Remember what he says is, unless I can see the holes that the nails made in his hands and can put my finger into the holes they made, and unless I can put my hand into his side, I refuse to believe. But that's interesting. The fact that he says, I refuse to believe, that suggests that, that he's thinking that whether or not he believes is something that he can do something that is actually under his control. And you might ask, does that really make sense? Is believing that's something that is under our voluntary control? So let's go off into a, a different example, sort of a political example. Um, consider beliefs about what's going to happen at the next election. The belief, for instance, that John Banks will fail to win at the Epsom seat, an act, will, an act will, as a result, be eliminated from the New Zealand Parliament. Okay. Now, now that I've articulated that claim, right, you will, each of you, just, I think, find yourself with a certain attitude to the truth of that claim. Probably quite a lot of us um, would, I expect, find that claim false. We probably think it probable that there are enough right-wing voters in Epsom to go along with the plan to preserve Act by electing Banks as the electorate MP. Um, maybe a number of us might find that we withhold judgment on this question. Uh, we may have heard that David Parker is going to stand in that seat for Labour, um, and we don't really know what the effect of that will be. Um, Maybe we think that a good many right-wingers in Epsom may be sick and tired of being used as pawns in a political game, and that that will have an effect. So maybe, and there may be other factors, so we're just not sure. Possibly some of us find that we actually do believe that Banks is going to fail. Uh, I imagine quite a few of us um, might wish that that would be true, but of course wishing that it's true is quite different from believing that it's going to be but the point I'm making is that what seems to be going on here is that we have available to us a certain body of evidence. I mean, maybe different ones of us have access to uh, different uh, bodies of evidence. Um, but uh, we find ourselves with, with certain evidence um, that is relevant 
to the truth of the question whether banks will win Epson or not, and we simply respond to that evidence um, as we weigh it with an attitude that is not directly under our voluntary control. So to speak, the evidence elicits from us a certain kind of response, either believing that banks is going to win, or um, believing that banks isn't, um, or um, believing neither way. Um, or if you really want to um, get sophisticated and talk in terms of degrees of belief, um, maybe we're very sophisticated and we can see that the evidence that banks is going to win makes that statement probable 0.75 or something. I don't know. <clears throat> now, um, so, for these sorts of reasons, just thinking about um, you know, ordinary cases like this, um, <clears throat> many philosophers agree that what you believe is not under your direct control. Um, there are people who have attempted to try and explain why belief couldn't be un under your direct control, and I'm certainly prepared to talk about that if people would like to. But if you think that belief is not under your control, uh, then how do you interpret the evidentialist uh, principle uh, as, for example, in Hume's formulation that a, a wise person um, formulate, uh, sorry, um, proportions her belief to her evidence. Um, uh, well, the interpretation um, that is given of that principle is just that it states conditions under which a belief is, so to speak, a worthwhile belief. A belief that it's good to have if you are aiming to believe what is true and avoid believing what is false, which is presumably quite important from a practical point of view, because if you, if you act on what you believe um, to be, uh, if, if you act on what you believe to be the case in attempting to fulfill your goals, you are surely more likely to succeed if those beliefs are true than if they are false. <coughs> so on this view, Evidentialism is the principle that a belief is worthwhile to the extent that it's based on evidence that supports its truth. Um, on this interpretation, it's a thesis about what philosophers call epistemic justification. Epistemic coming from the Greek word which means knowledge. It's a thesis about what it is for a person's belief state to have desirable status from the point of view of the epistemic goal, the knowledge goal of um, acquiring what is true and avoiding what is erroneous. Um, so if we interpret evidentialism in that sort of way, and I'll go back to Thomas, what Thomas must have really meant by what he said when he said, you know, unless I get this evidence, I refuse to believe. He must have meant, look, unless I get clear evidence that the crucified Jesus is alive, I'm just not going to be able to believe some evidence has got to um, uh, convince me. Um, nevertheless, uh, the story does tell us that he said, I refuse to believe, as if something was, uh, sorry, as if believing was something that he could do voluntarily, but wasn't willing to do unless he was given evidence that Jesus, the real flesh and blood, wounded and executed Jesus, was alive. And if you think about it, surely we, we do um, quite often speak of believing in this kind of way as something that we do or don't do voluntarily. Um, if you go back to my political example, um, can't we well imagine someone saying, I refuse to believe that Banks is going to win in Epsom. Um, but how can that make sense, given that it really does seem that we can't just believe um, what we like purely at will. Well, I think there's quite a simple solution to this puzzle. Um, and as very often happens in philosophy, you get a solution by making a distinction. Um, and the distinction that I think we need to make is between believing in the sense of being
being the psychological state of thinking that something is true. So, I might write this up. So, does believing uh, equals being in the state of, let's say, holding uh, some proposition, P, whatever it is, to be true. That's one sense. But then there's another sense, believing in the sense of acting on the um, truth that P, or maybe uh, taking P to be true in practical reason. Um, <coughs> we don't have direct voluntary control over this. Being in these states is something that uh, is, requires us to respond to how things are, or at least how we're experiencing things as being. Right? But we do have direct voluntary control over what we take to be true when we come to act. <coughs> So, so when a person says, I refuse to believe this, and what they may mean is, I refuse to commit myself in practice to this belief or this assumption. And I think that's probably what's going on with the person who says that she refuses to believe that Banks is going to win at Epsom. Um, she's refusing to act on the truth of that assumption. Right? Maybe she's determined to start a stop Banks vote Goldsmith uh, movement, Goldsmith being the National Party uh, candidate for the seat, who um, is saying that he only wants the uh, party vote and not the electoral vote. Um, and obviously, um, it's going to be at least helpful if she is mentally required to believe that there's a real chance that Max can be defeated if she's going to commit herself to starting such a movement. <clears throat> well, I think it's that kind of thing that may be going on with doubting Thomas. Thomas initially refuses to believe in the sense that he refuses to practically commit himself to the truth of the claim that Christ has been raised. Um, what, Thomas, what Thomas says is that he's prepared to commit himself in practice to the truth of the resurrection only on condition that he's given evidence which supports that truth. So, this, I think, gives us another kind of evidentialism. Remember, the first, the first kind of evidentialism was just a claim about the epistemic status of the belief, right? that it's a worthwhile belief to have if you've got the epistemic goal of trying to get at the truth and avoid error, right? um, to the extent that, that um, it's founded on evidence that supports its truth. Right? But this is another kind of um, evidentialism, which rather governs the conditions under which one is entitled to accept in practice the truth of a proposition. And this is actually, I think, the classical form of evidentialism that you find in Locke and Hume. For any proposition P, one is entitled to commit oneself in practice to the truth that P only to the extent that one's evidence supports the truth that P. And this kind of evidentialism was elevated to the status of a moral principle um, in a famous essay by W.K. Clifford um, called The Ethics of Belief. Uh, and here, here's a, 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 um, a representative passage from Clifford, which is very often quoted. Um, he said, if a belief has been accepted on insufficient evidence, it is sinful because it is stolen in defiance of our duty to mankind. That duty is to guard ourselves from such beliefs as from a pestilence which may shortly master our own body and then spread to the rest of the town. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for everyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. 
It's a very strong language. But I think that um, Clifford is correct to understand that evidentialism in this form is really a moral principle. Certainly, whenever practical commitment to the truth of a belief um, can affect actions that are themselves morally, action, morally significant, then the principle that we should act only on beliefs that are based on adequate evidence is a moral principle. Right? I mean, our beliefs affect our actions. If our actions are morally significant, um, then sometimes it may be we're only acting in a certain way because we have a certain kind of belief. Right? And Clifford is saying, if your belief is, has been acquired in defiance of your duty to mankind, right? Um, then, then it's sinful, uh, it's wrong, it's a moral fault. So we may speak of moral evidentialism, and I think it's moral evidentialism that applies to the case of religious beliefs, such as belief in the resurrection. Moral evidentialism maintains then that to take a religious claim to be true in practice without having adequate evidence for the truth of that claim is a moral fault, um, since religious claims do affect how we live and how we act um, uh, in our relationships with others. And in fact, you would want to say, um, if a religious claim did not have that kind of significance, it didn't have quite a pervasive effect on how the person who believed it to be true lived um, his or her life, then it really wouldn't count as religious in the first place. <coughs> Okay, so the question um, to ask ourselves now is, is moral evidentialism correct? Um, and, uh, and perhaps even if you can think of some cases where you'd have to allow exceptions to it, um, is it correct at least as it applies to the case of religious beliefs and commitments? Well, one big issue is to explain what counts as adequate evidence for practical commitment. I mean, what it says is you're not morally entitled to take these religious claims to be true um, unless you believe them on the basis of adequate evidence. Well, what is adequate evidence for practical commitment to such a belief? Um, go back to um, Thomas. Uh, he has a very specific notion of what would be required for him to withdraw his refusal to believe that the Lord is living. He needs the experience of sensory contact with him, and not just any sensory contact. He wants to be able to confirm that this live body really is the body that was executed on the cross. Right. And I think we can um, take Thomas as expressing the notion of adequate evidence that uh, conforms to what I believe Locke and Hume and Clifford um, had in mind. To be adequate, Evidence for the claim that the crucified Lord is alive must be evidence that sufficiently supports the truth of that claim in accordance with the objective standards of what I like to call our, our widely shared empiricist evidential practice. This is a practice that has uh, operates with various um, objective standards um, and against which we assess how strong the evidence is for particular claims. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, this practice it, it begins with a, a, a with sort of common sense. Um, at the common sense level, um, we have a practice that allows that our perceptual beliefs count as our, count as our basic evidence. In our perceptual experience, we form perceptual beliefs which we take ourselves to be entitled to regard as true, though of course they're subject to various kinds of defeasibility conditions which allows us to screen out illusions and take into account unusual conditions where you're looking, turns out you're looking at things under red light or something of this kind. Um, and, and then we build up experience of regular patterns in our perceptual experience which then supports inferences beyond what we directly perceive. So if we hear a certain kind of noise, we can infer, e.g., that it's raining outside or whatever. Um, and of course, uh, and there's a long, long story here, but this common sense practice gets extended through the scientific method to support claims about what cannot, uh, 
couldn't possibly be sensually perceived. But the important thing about this practice is that no factual claim is going to be adequately supported by evidence without ultimate reference to what's accepted as known in perceptual experience and is open to being publicly checked. Uh, and of course, it's a major philosophical task to try to formulate the standards used in our empiricist evidential practice. Um, but the situation seems to be that we do at least have a practical grasp of how to operate in accordance with these standards. Now, um, does Thomas, we've sort of taken Thomas as uh, articulating a requirement that he needs to have evidence that would um, uh, pass muster according to this practice if he's going to believe that Jesus really has been raised. Does he get in the story, we take the story as true, which of course, uh, just for the sake of the argument, do, in the story, does he get evidence that meets the standards of our widely shared empiricist evidential practice? And I say, obviously not. Um, the gospel story makes it clear that Jesus' appearance is outside the way the world is accustomed to proceed. Remember, the doors are closed, but Jesus comes among them. Uh, he walks through closed doors, in other words. Now, Thomas may not be able to doubt that he and the other disciples had the experience of Jesus appearing to them as living and speaking, but their evidence, which includes the fact that if Jesus actually was there in the flesh, there would have had to be a violation of the laws of nature, strongly suggests a different interpretation of their experience, namely some kind of collective hallucination. Um, there's certainly, there are other ways of interpreting what happened to them that do not require them to say, oh, we've got now empirical proof of the resurrection. Right. Yet, the experience he's described as having in the story is utterly compelling for Thomas. There is Jesus, as he's experiencing it, inviting Thomas to do what he said he would need to do in order to believe. The Gospel story doesn't actually tell us that Thomas accepted the invitation. In fact, I think it rather strongly suggests that he does not. Um, Thomas experiences Christ offering himself to him in a remarkable gesture of love and trust. Give me your hand, put it into my side, and he can do no more than exclaim, my Lord and my God. So the suggestion that it might all be a hallucination, which I want to insist Thomas could not possibly rule out as a proponent of our um, empiricist evidential practice, right, could not be farther from Thomas's mind which suggests that what is going on here is not at all the formation of a belief in the light of adequate evidence as judged by our widely shared um, empiricist evidential practice. What is going on, I think, is the formation of a belief through what the pragmatist William James um, called a passional cause belief. What's happening is we're getting belief being formed by a passional cause. <coughs> Thomas, uh, uh, um, so just to explain that, Thomas has an experience in which Jesus transformed, transforms Thomas's guardedness into trust by using the very test that Thomas had proposed as sufficient for evidence-based belief to elicit practical trust in the power of the divine love. It may well be, I would certainly argue, um, that Thomas cannot be given independently, rationally sufficient empirical evidence for the resurrection of Christ. But he can be given a passionately, emotionally vivid experience of Christ's love for him and Christ's desire that Thomas be his follower. And of course, he, um, as the tradition has it, he went off and evangelized India. Um, through a passional cause, right, um, Thomas comes to believe that Christ is risen and to commit himself for the truth of that belief in his life. 
is doing, is doing so involves um, a belief that's formed by a passional cause and then his taking that belief and by, this is my sort of term for a, a leap of faith, a doxastic venture, this comes from the Greek word for belief, um, he has a belief and then it's got a passional cause, it's not based on adequate evidence, but he then takes it to be true in practice and commits himself. He believes it in, in this sense, right, which in, is under his control. <clears throat> Uh, so he takes as true in practice um, a claim for whose truth he lacks adequate evidence, as he himself would be able to recognize at least on reflection. Now, is Thomas entitled to do such a thing? Or do we have to say with Clifford, it is wrong always, everywhere, and for everyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence? Well, if you think Thomas is entitled to do this, um, then it must be that moral evidentialism doesn't apply universally and doesn't apply um, uh, to this kind of religious case, at least if the standards of adequate evidence implied by the moral evidentialist principle are the standards applicable to this widely shared empiricist evidential practice, um, uh, which I've been mentioning. Now, of course, somebody might well say, might well be objected, that Thomas's experience is powerful evidence for him of the truth of Jesus' living presence. It seems overwhelmingly clear to him that Jesus is alive. So it might be argued, there's no belief without evidence here. Uh, there's no leap beyond what is reasonably indicated by the evidence that he has. But, of course, this is very much subjective evidence. It's, it's not, I don't think, what the evidentialists were concerned about. Um, if, if you're prepared to say, well, you know, um, the moral evident, evidentialist requirement is, is fulfilled in this kind of way, then I think you're making moral evidentialism trivially weak if all it requires is ev evidence in the sense of what actually produces full belief. Because, I mean, the important point here is that um, Full belief, such as the belief that in the story Thomas evidently has, that Christ really is alive, loves him, trusts him, wants him to be his follower, right? Um, that is something that is being caused in him very decidedly. But is it being caused by something that counts as evidence according to the objective standards that are in our widely shared evidential practice? I think rather obviously not. Um, so <coughs> Um, uh, I mean, you might arguably say that no claim can ever be believed unless its truth is somehow made evident to the person concerned. I mean, you could almost say that to believe something is to find the truth of it evidence, right? Um, and then uh, the evidentialist principles will turn out to be um, trivial and have no bite at all. So I think it's important to distinguish um, between causes of belief that also count as evidence available to the believer that the claim believed is true, um, and we can call those evidential causes, and causes of belief that don't count uh, in that way. But it's also important to make it clear that a belief has an evidential cause in a meaningful sense only when those causes count as evidence according to some relevant established evidential practice with at least reasonably objective or intersubjective standards that can be appealed to. Now, of course, there may be several such established evidential practices. This one, which uh, you know, involves the practices of science, may be very important, but it may not um, be the only one. There is, for example, a Christian religious evidential practice which employs evidential standards, which admit special categories of evidence, like the evidence of revealed scriptures or the evidence of certain kinds of religious experience. Thomas's experience of Christ is adequate evidence of the resurrection according to the Christian evidential practice. But the classic, classical moral evidentialists, of course, won't admit such evidence as meeting the moral evidentialist requirement. They're appealing to a wider evidential practice 
from which overall entitlement to the Christian commitment is to be judged. Fair enough, if you've already made the commitment into, say, um, a particular religious world, if you like Christianity, then um, you may uh, be involved in a specifically Christian evidential practice. But the question is, what entitles you to make that commitment in the first place? Well, some philosophers might argue that Christian commitment does not need to satisfy any uh, external evidentialist requirements. Um, but, but if they say that, I think that turns out to be equivalent to rejecting moral evidentialism um, and holding uh, uh, that Christian commitment does require a doxastic venture, commitment to the truth of what is believed on a passion rather than an evidential basis. So the question arises whether people are entitled to religious doxastic ventures and maybe similarly um, kind of totalizing overall worldview ventures which might be found in, say, political ideology or um, at the foundations of our ethics it may not just be the religious case where we find this. Are people entitled to such ventures, and if so, under what conditions? This is a question which is famously addressed by William James in his 1896 lecture, The Will to Believe. He argues that leaps of faith, in the sense of doxastic ventures, are permissible only when one faces a vitally important option, whether you do or do not commit yourself in practice to a certain claim about the world, and only when that option cannot, in principle, be settled by intellectual weighing of evidence. And I uh, have argued myself that I think James implicitly wants to add, uh, and I think it would be good to bring this out, two further conditions that evolve, involve ethical evaluation. That is, that one may make such a doxastic venture only when one's motivation for doing so is morally acceptable, and only when the content of the belief to which commitment is made is itself um, of moral worth. So the sort of world that you're coming to believe in this way is a world that it would be a good way for the world to be, so to speak. Um, and I think these conditions may rule out um, using this to sort of justify additional thinking, um, as well as um, using it to in, uh, bring us to commitment to morally objectionable forms of religion, such as, for example, um, believing in Nazi-type gods who enjoin racial purity. I've just got one more paragraph, and then I then I will stop. I'm sorry, this has gone on rather more than I rather longer than I expected. But, so, thank you for your patience. So the final thing I want to say is that people can make these doxastic ventures, however, only when they already have a passional tendency to hold the belief to whose truth they then commit themselves in practice. And if a doxastic venture is a good one, allowing alignment with a truth which would otherwise have been inaccessible, then having the passional motivation to believe it is indeed good fortune. And it's that kind of good fortune that Jesus in the Gospel story remarks on at the end of it. You believe because you can see me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas and the Twelve were passionately caused to believe by extraordinary means, by really quite astonishing experiences. But the many who followed them had their beliefs passionately caused in a more mundane way by having a living tradition handed down to them a tradition that commended a certain kind of practical orientation to the world, the kind of practical orientation captured in Jesus' great commandment, love one another as I have loved you. The wisdom of taking up such a practical orientation is not something that can be intellectually established on the basis of independent evidence from some kind of initially neutral position, but it may be wisdom nonetheless.
very simple question. Uh, what's the definition of doxastic? Doxastic. Oh, well, it, it just comes from the um, word, the Greek word belief. Oh, okay. So a doxastic venture is, um, it's not, I mean, uh, sometimes people think that it's, it's, uh, it's the inducing of a belief in yourself when you realize the evidence doesn't support it. And that can't be done. That's not what we're talking about at all. It's rather when you find you do believe something um, that's you know, important to you and that you think it may be important for the way you live your life to take it to be true. Right? Um, and yet you recognize that you couldn't show um, that it's intellectually compelling in accordance with some objective evidential practice right, that is widely shared. And so you make a doxastic venture when you commit yourself to it nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying to yourself, oh, you know, I'd better not believe it, I'd better not act on it then, even though I'm inclined to believe it, because I must um, you know, I haven't got sufficient evidence. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, a few, a few things. Um, firstly, I'm wondering why this you know, this idea of the shared of true practice. I'm wondering why a lot of this isn't just a counterexample to that um, as a view of practical reasoning in general. Because it seems to me that while the shared evidential practice might be very effective in, say, biology or physics, it would be pretty disastrous, I think, in ethics or in political philosophy or in any sort of practical normative subject which required people to make substantial moral commitments. I think most things wouldn't meet that practice, which would. Um, so I guess that's the, the first thing I'd like to hear. And the second thing is, what do you think of people who extend the empiricist evidential practice to include things like seeming, like say Michael Hume's view, which don't necessarily compel belief, but allow intuitions that are not strictly speaking empirical, like a prior intuitions or moral intuitions? So those are the two things I like. Okay, right. Well, um, I think the empiricist evidential practice um, is going to apply to commitments about you know, what kind of a world this is. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, if, when we think about moral commitments, um, I think it's, um, it's rather plain that, that you're right, that there's no sort of wider practice against we, which we can um, uh, assess um, uh, you know, con conflicts about um, ultimate moral principles. I mean, obviously there's... Um, you know, there are widely shared moral principles, right? Yeah. But there do seem to be some kinds of disagreements which um, are, are basic and are not able to be adjudicated um, within some sort of wider context. Um, now, um, so, so I would try to think, yes, that um, what I'm calling doxastic venture um, and committing yourself on the basis of something that is a pa can only be a passion or non evidential goal is pretty common um, as far as our basic um, normative commitments go. Yeah, so, it's a um, um, but, so, uh, so, in the sense, that's. Um, uh, and, and, and then what I want to suggest is that even though um, religious claims uh, don't involve, I mean, basic religious claims are not just purely normative, right? <laughs> their claims about what kind of a world this is, you know, um, though they may be claims about it being a world to which certain kinds of normative commitment and practice are well fitted. Um, so, uh, so what I'm wanting to claim, and I'm just saying the same thing as William James claims here, um, that that applies to religious views of the world and not just to the fundamental normative principles themselves. Um, so, uh, so your first point I don't quite see as an, um, it isn't really an objection, but it's, um, it's a way of, uh, so to speak, widening the scope of what I'm right. saying, and, to, and perhaps to show that it's rather familiar. So, uh, no, I'm not suggesting that, argue, that we could somehow apply our empiricist evidential practice mm -hmm. to the um, uh, to the question of what normative um, beliefs to hold. I mean, that would involve some kind of category error, it seems mm -hmm. to me, on the right. Yes. Um, now, um, now, the other question that you um, raised is a question about seemingness. Yeah, right. Um, and so what, what you mean there 
uh, and I was I was trying actually to um, uh, to advert to that, um, but perhaps not explicitly, when I said at a certain point, well, look, surely it just seems surely Thomas has remarkably good evidence yes, to follow the search, because it seems overwhelmingly clear to him that the Lord, the real Lord, is there. Um, now, uh, I, um, I interpret that as just another way of talking about a passion on the cause. Right. I mean, a, a ceiling like that uh, is, uh, um, well, it's, it's not, I don't want to say it's purely private, mm -hmm. because presumably um, exactly the same kind of ceiling happened to, the, to, to each of the other, um, you know, the yeah, other. Sure. Eleven, um, and presumably um, in moral context, you know, I see gross injustice, and I feel absolutely outraged, yes. and that's clearly wrong. And lots of other people get the same response, but only empirical, right? So be patient. Yeah. Y yes. Uh, um, and uh, you know, I'm I'm wanting to make a place for such things. Right. So I have a suspicion that um, uh, there may be just a sort of um, a kind of terminological right. Um, uh, because obviously, um, you know, somebody who, who says, well, um, I mean, I, I, I want to argue um, that provided there is a few other conditions are um, satisfied, Thomas was entitled to make his docetic venture, right. as I imagine Hume, Hume would want to, on the basis of the scene. Um, it, actually, it might be that the Jacobin position um, actually adds more um, constraints. Yes. Um, and I think that that's rather important. Because supposing, I mean, you could tell a Thomas-type story um, in relation to the experience of some um, incredibly uh, conscientious and committed Nazi, right, um, who has, I mean, um, there are some people who argue that Nazis deserves to be treated as a kind of religion. You know? um, and in terms of the Nazi mythology, which I don't really know enough about, you could probably describe an experience where it seems to you that you are being empowered by the source of, um, you know, whatever, it to, to go out and, and wage war on behalf of the, the purity of the white race or some horrifying thing like this. Right? Um, now, uh, if you, if you just say that what justifies Thomas is the how overwhelmingly it seems to him to be true, right, then you're going to have to say that uh, uh, this um, sort of Nazi hero um, is justified uh, equally. And that's where I want to say, well, actually, if you realize that, this, this, that um, these are passionately caused beliefs and whether the Nazistic venture is justifiable is going to depend on <clears throat> that uh, it really does involve a commitment to something that couldn't be established by evidence. Because one of James' very important points is um, that you don't, you don't do this with things that are properly decided by evidence. And then, the conditions that I want to add, um, you've got to be sure that your motivation is the right kind. That it's not just a matter of your wishful self-interest mm. trying to convince yourself, so to speak, and deceive yourself into taking the world a certain way. But then the thing that we'll really do here is um, that the, the view of the world that you're committing yourself has to be admirable, right? Ha has itself to be morally admirable. Now, of course, and so we, we can tell, we know very well, that a worldview that is based on um, ideals of racial purity is um, morally completely to be ruled out, right? Um, now, of course, it might be that, tragically, the person utterly caught up in Nazi culture um, thinks that he's justified mm -hmm. when, in fact, he, he's not. So I, don't, I can't really guarantee that. But, uh, but I, think, I think you've got a little bit more to play with here than you have if you just appeal to a seeming. Right. But I suspect that people who are appealing to seemings are really appealing to the same sort of thing. And when Chris um, uh, Tucker hears me talk about these kind of people, he says, why are you talking about passional causes? Uh, mm -hmm. We should get that out of the way and talk instead about seemings of phenomenal conservatism. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. 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 Y